So welcome everyone again. Uh, this week we'll have the pleasure of receiving Timothy Furst, uh, who is the William and Dorothy O'Neill Professor of Economics at the University of Notre Dame. And he also serves as Senior Economic Advisor at the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland. Uh, before joining the faculty at Notre Dame, Professor Furst worked for many years at uh, Bowling Green State University, and he started his career as I understand at Northwestern University. He's a graduate from the University of Chicago, and his research interests include monetary policy uh, and theory, with a special focus on business cycles. Uh, Professor Fuss has published in the American Economic Review, the Journal of Monetary Economics, the Journal of Economic Theory, uh, and many other journals, and he also has served on the editorial board of the American Economic Review and is a current member of the editorial board of the Journal of Money, Credit and Banking. And I can testify that Professor first loves to whistle. <laughs> 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 uh, so uh, I'm reading this from his bio that he has on his web page. Uh, uh, I, can, I can assure you that he's one of the happiest men that I have ever met, uh, and that is something contagious. So, uh, welcome everyone, and welcome, welcome, Tim Forrest. Uh, thank, thank you for that kind introduction, Alberto. Uh, Alberto, or whoever, if you just let me know if um, uh, sound is a problem, but hopefully my voice is uh, uh, clear. Um, so, first of all, I'd like to thank again Alberto for uh, the introduction and for this opportunity. Um, this is my first time doing a webinar, so I hope you'll all be uh, patient with me, and I'm delighted to talk with you about uh, my work. So, anyway, most of this is joint to work with uh, Chuck Karlstrom at the Cleveland Fed and uh, Matthias uh, Potzin at the um, Board of Governors. And actually, in some sense, uh, this paper or this presentation is a long introduction to uh, a paper that we're currently just finishing up. Um, uh, let, let me get into the introduction. I think it'll be clear why I, I need such a long introduction. So in any event, uh, this research uh, program is trying uh, to understand the behavior of this uh, variable that's charted here. Um, this is from this series by Kim and Wright that's available at the uh, Federal Reserve Board. They have, I think it's like a 2009-2008 working paper that lays out their method of calculating the term premium. And then the site is updated regularly uh, to give the most recent data. So um, this is their measure of their term premium. So the question that motivates the talk, um, and in some sense this paper, is trying to understand the behavior of the term premium, uh, and to what extent should the term premium matter for monetary policy. Um, so this latter part means that this is more than just a finance sort of question. Um, there's a large literature in finance that tries to understand behavior of premia, equity premia, term premia, um, by in some sense feeding into a model some exogenous path for consumption. Um, but from a central bank's point of view, that's not particularly helpful. <laughs> the central bank does not think of consumption as an exogenous process. So trying to understand the interaction between term premia and uh, real activity, term premia and monetary policy is sort of the, the broader focus here. Um, so, so that's the, um, uh, what motivates all of this, trying to understand data like this. So I guess I'll just take as a given the Fed, uh, the, the central bank of the U.S. definitely thinks this is an important question. and In some sense, they view it as an instrument of monetary policy today. So I'll just give you a couple of suggestive quotes. Here's Governor Stein, who in particular mentions this, where he says that he uses the phrase, uh, expected excess return. Uh, let's see here, Alberto. I forget where are the drawing com the drawing controls. I don't see those now. Just in a, in the top bar below the icons. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, there they're not draw. there now. Draw. Yeah, my here. draw has disappeared. No, I don't have a draw. I have the oh, here's draw. Ah, very good. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Um, so, in any event, uh, he uses this phrase right inside. He calls the ex expected excess returns of long-term treasuries. Uh, well, I don't find in particular what I mean by that, but that's what is. That's another way of saying the term premium. That we should think of this as a uh, possible extra instrument, or at least a 
part of monetary, something that monetary policy should be thinking about. Um, here's uh, Governor Bernanke, um, not Chairman Bernanke, but Governor Bernanke from over 10 years ago. And I'll come back to this quote at the end. Um, but if you read through this quote, it's actually sort of astonishing that one way that the then governor thought about thinking about a long rate policy is essentially the same way the Fed has traditionally handled the federal funds rate, to set a target and then passively allow the balance sheet to hit that target. And that's sort of the policy he's talking about there. I'll come back to that at the end because I think that's sort of a um, sort of a motivating quote for a policy question. And then last, you know, this language we've seen again and again in the United States from FOMC minutes or FOMC statements about um, uh, policy. And if you keep in mind, the central bank is already announcing a fairly you know, long path for the funds rate. So we have some sense of where the Fed thinks the funds rate is going to be over some horizon. So if you're going to move the long rate independent of the funds rate, that necessarily means you're trying to affect the term premium. Um, or you can, of course, affect long rates by moving paths of short rates. But evidently, the central bank thinks it can move the long rate independent of the path of the short rates. And that means they think they can affect the term premium. So I think it is given that the Federal Reserve thinks the term premium is a policy tool that's on the table. So here's my uh, plan for the, the talk today. Uh, first, uh, look, there's two ways or two approaches of integrating the term premium in a modern DSG model. Um, you can either take a traditional model with uh, frictionless trade in assets and alter preferences uh, in a certain way, or you could keep traditional preferences and somehow limit the ability of uh, participants to um, trade to eliminate all arbitrage opportunity. So I'm going to outline both of those. At the beginning of the talk, I'll start with the um, uh, frictionless setting. Um, and I hopefully will suggest to you that there's good reasons to think about the second approach. <laughs> the finance approach is really the first, uh, the first approach, that if we think about more general preferences, maybe there's ways to understand a term premium for a given uh, uh, way of thinking asset markets. But actually, well, one looks more carefully at how that explanation works. I personally have some troubles with it. I think there's at least some uh, interest in the segmented market approach. By the way, the segmented market approach is definitely what the Fed has in mind. It's really hard to understand quantitative easing unless you believe that markets are somehow segmented. Um, it's very hard to believe that the Fed thinks it can affect the covariance structure of assets returns with consumption. Uh, that, that would be, uh, they surely don't think that's what they're doing. They think they're somehow affecting the ability of arbitrage or segmentation across markets. So in some sense, I think the Fed believes the second. But I want to review both because the first one is so prominent. So a couple of definitions just to get a sense of what the term premium is. Um, so uh, QNT is going to be just a traditional, uh, these are pure discount bonds. So you always want to think of Q as being a number uh, less than one. So they pay out a dollar in some period ahead. So Q is some number less than one. Um, the expectations hypothesis, that's what the EH says, essentially says that the bond price is just given by the, the sequence of expected short rates. So you notice now I now have a one, so that these are all one period bonds. It's a series of one period bonds. <laughs> Sorry for my circles, they get bigger as I go along. <laughs> it's a series of one period bonds so that um, if I compare the price of the actual bond and the path of the short rates, the term premium is just that gap. Um, if you believe that data that I started with at the beginning of the talk, uh, 100 basis points is not such a bad estimate for the average level of the term premium. I'll take that as a given, but that particular number isn't that important. But you think about that as about the ballpark uh, sort of premium we're trying to hit. So the first comment, if you want to use traditional preferences, this is almost impossible to get and, uh, in a frictionless setting. So if we have frictionless asset trade and we use traditional preferences in a DSG model, it's almost impossible to get this to happen. And the because is important, um, you need a weird time series behavior. And I'll define what I mean by peculiar or odd. And the important thing to notice is it's not a real pricing kernel. It's a nominal pricing kernel. Um, so the nominal pricing kernel is going to inherit the behavior of inflation, which tends to be highly autocorrelated. Um, so the fact that it's nominal is important. And you'll see what I mean by peculiar time series behavior. So anyway, suppose we get a frictionless uh, uh, model, frictionless asset trade. So that means there is a stochastic discount factor. 
The only thing I want to emphasize again is you want to think about this being a nominal stochastic discount factor. Um, so it's not just marginal rates of substitution across time. It's also adjusted for paths of inflation. So one way to write the, the, the bond price then is just given by this, um, where the actual bond price is just the, the product of a series of one step ahead stochastic discount factors. Um, the payoff at the end is one. That's why there's no number here. They get one dollar at the end. So there's just one here. The expectations hypothesis essentially gets rid of all the covariances because just looking at the series of mean levels of stochastic discount factors. So the difference between the actual bond price and the expectation bond price is what the term premium is. So how could QN be less than, how could this guy uh, sell at a discount compared to this guy? Or how could that guy have a higher return than this guy? It's evidently that these M's are somehow negatively covariant. So let me look at that in a little more detail. You can write it out like this. So this makes it quite clear. It's you, the bond price is the expectations component plus a series of covariances. Um, uh, I guess I should mention two things. One is it's, uh, it's in some sense, it's the infinite, well, not the infinite, but the long sequence of covariances. But the latter ones become less important because they're always being weighted by a, in some sense, by a bond price. So these later ones become less, less important. So we're talking about early covariances mattering. So if I look at the early covariance, I need these numbers to be negative. I need these first numbers to be negative. So for example, here's just to give you a sense of what this thing looks like. Suppose I take as given a to pass the stochastic discount factor. So I let it be an AR1. Uh, where you have an innovation, a stochastic discount factor that's normal so that uh, M itself is log normal. You can write out just with a pencil and paper what the term premium is. So I'm letting, uh, I think I used that notation before, uh, expectation of psi being the uh, term premium, then I adjust it by the um, number of periods and the variance of the shock. Um, well, this thing is going to be positive. You're going to have a positive premium if and only if you have negative autocorrelation. And so here's a picture, um, sort of illustrative. Negative autocorrelation is essential, right? You've got to have rho less, than one, rho less than zero. But even with, I mean, rho, if you go to minus one, you can't even get, you get to like a basis point. So if we're trying to get 100 basis points, this is a fool's errand. Oops. This is a fool's errand. You're just not going to get to it. That, of course, you know, before I move on to this, we can look at it more generally. Suppose we have AR4. So here's... Uh, as a, I'm, an, I'm no econometrician, but um, I can I think about it as a theorist. So the way I think about identifying stochastic discount factors one period ahead is uh, to, in some sense, think about one-year rates of interest. So I'm using the one-year treasury rate, the nominal treasury from 62 to 2014. Um, and I'm using that as an observable, and then I'm just having Dynair using traditional uh, Bayesian estimation method uh, estimate those rows and estimate the variance of the shock. So you can see what I get here. Um, this is what Dynair spits out to me. So you notice you get positive autocorrelation here. Um, the first two autocorrelation coefficients significantly positive, and here's your variance. Well, what uh, mean term premium do you get out of here? Well, again, it just <laughs> we went from minus one basis point to minus 26. And again, recall we're trying to get to something like plus 100. Um, so a Frictionless setting seems difficult. So why is it, in some sense, that these stochastic discount factors tend to be autocorrelated? The reason is I sort of alluded to. Um, and if I use traditional preferences, it's broken down like this. Um, here's the typical uh, marginal rate substitution between today and tomorrow. And then here's an adjustment for um, inflation. Um, this first term, in some sense, what the equity premium puzzle originally was about is just that for reasonable levels of risk aversion, this thing just doesn't move very much. So I have very little movement margin rates of substitution. So that means really what's driving the stochastic discount factor is the behavior of inflation. But of course, inflation is positively autocorrelated. So it is going to be almost impossible to hit a term premium with traditional preference. It's just not possible as long as inflation is positively autocorrelated. Now, I'm going to do something a little bit silly here. This is a cookbook approach. So how, what do I need? What I need is I need the 
early movements of the stochastic discount factor to be different than the later ones. I need that negative autocorrelation early on. So I, I call this a cookbook approach. I'm just going to sort of assume what I need. What, what do I need the stochastic discount factor to look like to get this sort of behavior? So you notice what I have here is essentially what looks like an, uh, a ARMA. So I have innovations that have a one-time effect. So that's, this is the one-time effect of the innovation. And then this is the typical AR part. So I have a moving average part here and then an ARMA part here. So I'm sorry, then an AR part here. So that if I let theta be negative, that's going to allow the first movement. So that the you think about this being a shock that pushes up the stochastic discount factor. The first stochastic discount factor can go way down, although the subsequent path can be positive. That's like a cookbook approach. What would I need? Now, I mentioned this is a funny cookbook, but you will exactly see this, this cookbook uh, making a dinner <laughs> a little bit later. But this, if you just think about it mechanically, this is what you need. So as I mentioned, this is really just saying that the casting discount factor follows an ARMA, where you need, uh, you need the behavior of the initial guys to be opposite. So 1 plus theta and rho have to be of opposite sides. So rho is the AR part. Theta is the moving average part, so you need theta to be less than minus 1. In fact, you'll see you need it actually to be a lot less than minus 1. So again, just like before, you can write out in, with pencil and paper what the uh, term premium looks like for an end period bond with some variance of the uh, stochastic discount factor. It's very similar to before, except now we got these thetas sprinkled throughout. And again, the top term and the bottom term differ by covariance. So uh, let's see what these pictures look like. So they've got on the vertical axis here is the term premium. Again, we want to get something like 100 basis points. We want to get up here somewhere. That's our goal. Can you hit it? Well, actually, you can hit it reasonably easily if theta is negative. So I need, um, if I'm up over here, so what does that mean? I need theta to be very negative. That's what's on my horizontal axis. So I need a, a negative theta. And I've drawn these for two different ARs. So I've got an AR positive and an AR negative. I actually now need an AR1 that's positive, or I need an AR coefficient that's positive. And then I need the moving average uh, component to be negative enough. So something like this and something like a big negative theta will give it to me. Here's looking at that same sort of thing differently. So what I've graphed now is the autocorrelation coefficient rho. Again, if I want to get something like 100 basis points, I'm going to need and this red line is getting it. So what's the red line? It's I have theta sufficiently negative, and then I have rho sufficiently positive or autocorrelated. So you can get it. You can get it with uh, this cookbook approach. So I mentioned the cookbook is not completely out of thin air. The cookbook, when you put it in the oven and bake it. Um, it becomes these preferences. Now, maybe you all knew this, but this is something I did not know, that essentially what these Epstein's in preferences do is they give you exactly the needed ARMA. <laughs> you need, it gives you exactly this uh, initial movement in the stochastic discount vector to be opposite the subsequent movement. So I've, uh, the, the next few slides are sort of driven by this uh, very nice paper by Glenn Rudebush and Eric Swanson and the AEJ from just a few years ago, where they take a standard DSG model, use Epstein's in preferences, and talk about the term premium. Um, so I want to go through that briefly. But what I want to point out to you is how what they do, or the Epstein's in thing does, it gives you exactly the cookbook sort of approach that I mentioned. So right, here's the uh, uh, Epstein's in preferences. Notice if I had theta equal to 0 up here, this would just become a standard Bellman equation. Um, it's a little bit different now because I, I love their phrase. They have this phrase where they say the value function is twisted. I think that's a great language. <laughs> the value function is twisted. Now, why do I got these negative signs in here? Well, well first of all, what I mean by twisting, you see it's raised to a power. And so the expectation of the value function to a power. So that's a highly nonlinear object, and then you're sort of undoing that power out here. So it's, the value function is twisted by this theta guy. I'm purposely using theta the same as before because it's going to have that same connotation. You need that theta to be big enough to give you the cookbook approach. Now, why do I got these negative signs sort of splintered all through here? I, I'm just following Glenn and um, uh, Eric's paper. Um, for this utility functional, utility is negative, right? So I've got, for sigma bigger than 1, which is the case I want to think about, utility is negative. 
So that means lifetime utility is negative, but I'm going to be raising lifetime utility to a power. So it's convenient, as you can imagine, um, to uh, have that thing positive. So it turns out the way to do Epstein's in preference is you, in some sense, this is like the absolute value of the value function. And then you've got to restore it to its negativity by putting that negative there. Um, so in any event, what is risk aversion? Risk aversion comes from theta, the si absolute value of theta. So the bigger it's theta, the more risk averse these people are. And then if you're familiar with these Epstein's in preferences, the sigma then just gives the inner temporal elasticity of substitution. So how I think about uh, saving today versus tomorrow, and this is how I care about risk. So there, as you're, I'm sure, well aware of that, in standard preferences, there's no separation between theta and sigma, but the advantage of these preferences is you get them. So in any event, what's important here is the stochastic discount factor. So just take a moment and look at that guy. And I think you'll see two things. First, the latter part, this thing down here, is exactly the standard. That's nothing new. And we know that's not going to help. This will never allow you to get, you have to overcome that, because <laughs> that's moving the wrong way. So what do we got in the first? Well, I would suggest to you that this first part, which is sort of odd looking, I grant all that, and you got these negative signs, but the thing I want to call your attention to, up essentially, essentially that baby is a um, uh, forecast error. It's an innovation, right? It's innovations with we these weird powers, but essentially it's a forecast error. It's an innovation. So I've got a one-time innovation followed by an AR. So a one-time innovation followed by an AR. Well, the one-time innovation is just the moving average part. This is the AR. So this thing has built into an ARMA process. So it's Epstein's then gives you the delivery of the what the cookbook said you needed. So anyway, I'll oh, back up a little bit to what uh, this paper by Glenn and uh, Eric had mentioned. Um, a key observation, a key outcome is these two right here, that to use Epstein's in preferences, if you do a first order approximation to the model, that Epstein's in stuff disappears. Linearization makes that disappear. So you have to do high order approximation. So they do a third order. You need to get a second order to get a term premium. You need to do a third order to get a variable term premium. So, so they do actually do a third order. But the thing I want to call your attention to is this, this bullet point here. The behavior of inflation and output and consumption, et cetera, are completely unaffected numerically. Quantitatively, they're almost the same. A third order decision rule, the impulse response function coming with third order decision rule is essentially the same as a first order decision rule. So in some sense, there's no, there's sort of like a separation. They're going to be to deliver some different predictions on asset pricing, but there's really no different business cycle behavior predicted by the model. That's sort of important. There's a separation here. That leads me up to here. If in some sense the model generates output, inflation, consumption, all the normal stuff independent of what's going on with the term premium, and the term premium just comes out of higher order approximation, I can sort of replicate what Rudabush and Swanson did on the cheap. So this is like a cheap version of Rudabush and Swanson. I'm just going to take a consumption process that is similar to what they get in their DSG model. So they have a DSG model with PFP shocks, and they got, I think there's, I forget, there may be a persistence in inflation, but there's inertia in the policy rule in any event. They end up with a uh, behavior of, an, of consumption that uh, is like something like an AR3, so it's sort of like hump shapes. So this AR3 is, gives you the consumption behavior like they have in their model. So I'm going to take that as a given. And then the two key parameters are how big this theta is. Again, if you're offering a cookbook, we need theta pretty big. And then the other thing that's going to matter is the subsequent behavior of inflation. So what is this eta? Eta is how inflation responds to the consumption path. So the key thing that's driving their paper is that they're looking at to uh, TFP shocks that make consumption and inflation move oppositely. And if you think about it, that's what's going to be critical because you're going to want a positive innovation in consumption is going to make the uh, pricing kernel move down at, at to begin with. There's going to be initial movement down because of the easy stuff, but then the persistence in inflation is going to put it be positive subsequently. So you're going to get a negative autocorrelation at the very beginning. I'll show you pictures to illustrate that. So anyway, here's just some uh, numbers to give you a sense of what you need. So I got my thetas across the top up here and my different eta's here. 
the, the key uh, combinations are up here somewhere. Um, you need uh, theta negative, is what I saw from before. You need theta sufficiently negative, and you need negative correlation of consumption and inflation. Um, so that's the two things I mentioned. I guess what I should call your attention to is these numbers are astonishing. Risk aversion of well over 100 are needed to get this. Now, I should say these numbers are somewhat sensitive to the AR coefficients, right? To the extent that you have more long-run risk in the economy, you can get higher premium uh, for smaller risk aversions. But even with those, you need pretty significant risk aversion numbers. So here's what's going on. So here's just a impulse response function for the stochastic uh, discount factor. So I have a, this is a shock to consumption. Again, let me slide back up to where I was. So I get an innovation to consumption that leads to a negative innovation in inflation. So think about something like a productivity shock that pushes up consumption but persistently pushes down inflation. Now I need an innovation. The uh, easy parameter is going to be innovation. So notice, if I have theta equals zero, which is the traditional preferences, so for theta equals zero, this is the no easy effect. You just don't get enough movement in a stochastic discount factor to begin with. You notice it does go down. And then it goes up. That's good. <laughs> it's negative to autocorrelate. But it's just nowhere near enough. Nowhere near enough. If I go back to the previous slide, when I do theta zero, you just there's just not enough there. In fact, in fact, you always get negative autocorrelation or negative premium. But as I jack up the theta, and here's I drive it all the way up to 150, I can get this guy to be arbitrarily pulled down. So I can pull it down really sharply. So the initial movement is down. And then it goes up. And if you notice, it's maybe not obvious here, but it is above zero now. So it's a negative innovation down, followed by a persistent movement up. So this negative innovation down, again, it's the early covariances that matter. So this is going to allow me to get the premium here. If I look at the um, behavior of the bond price, what's critical is the fact that this guy is negative. So the idea is, to back up here, when M is low, when the stochastic discount factor is low, I need the bond price to be high. That's what will give me a premium. So when the stochastic discount factor, oops, so I went too far. And when the stochastic discount factor is low, and if I have a big enough easy effect, I can get a really negative innovation in M. I need the subsequent M's to be positive. And see, they pile up. They're small positive, but they pile up. And when they pile up, they lead to an increase in the bond price. And that will do it. So an easy effect will get it. So back to the stochastic discount factor. Let me call your attention to this. So again, the key idea is that this term gives me an innovation that moves oppositely this term if this guy is big enough. That's how it works. And that's exactly the cookbook approach. Now, that's the traditional or one way of getting a, a, uh, a term premium, and this is sort of like the finance approach. So you somehow mix around with preferences, and this is what uh, Glenn and uh, Eric nicely show you can do in these models. So I have three concerns with it. One is we're explaining the term premium by, in some sense, we're taking an innovation that we don't observe and we're raising it to a huge power. <laughs> it just seems, I don't know, there's this old saying that, a person's assumptions and a person's conclusion should be more than a gentleman's distance from one another. Um, and this is, this is, I mean, it's almost like the, the preferences assume exactly what is needed. That's what I mean by a cookbook approach. That makes me a little, un, uh, makes me a little nervous, I guess. Secondly, you need very high risk aversion. So we're talking to the orders of 100. But my mother-in-law hates to fly, but she's not even that nervous on an airplane. This is an incredible risk aversion. Another thing that's sort of odd is this, and I will just throw this out here and I'll demonstrate what I mean by this, um, a fine transformation. Now, where does that come from? Let me back up before I go ahead. Again, look at my, my pricing kernel. What is in the this first term is not, the, not a derivative, but a level. This is the level of lifetime utility. So this is the level of lifetime utility compared to the expected level of lifetime utility. So when we think about lifetime utility, you begin to think about it's not margin utility. So these are not like growth rates or something. This is movements in the level. So that level is going to matter for fine transformations. I'll show you what I mean. So suppose I take the utility function just at a constant. So it's an affine transformation. 
So add a constant to the utility function. Now, what does that mean? Well, more generally, you could think about suppose you had, had leisure in this model, or suppose you had uh, government purchases and families get some utility over the government purchase flow. What's important about K is it's some part of utility that does not move sharply with consumption. So I'm just imagining it just as given it's independent of consumption. Um, so anything that does not move much with consumption I, is the same argument applies for. I'm just letting it be a constant. To make things simple so we don't have all these negative, I'm going to choose K big enough so that cons utility is always positive. And to normalize, I'll set consumption equal to 1. So since I have utility always positive, I can get rid of those negative signs. And so I have now a pricing kernel that doesn't have all those crazy negative signs. Again, we have the typical um, uh, EZ stuff. And then here is the standard sort of preference specification. So all I'm going to do is show you that as you vary K, um, it's going to affect how big of a risk premium you get. And this, I think this sort of summarizes it well, more than I could even say now. I just said it, have you look at what it says up there. What matters is when there's an innovation to consumption, how does lifetime utility move compared to what it was anticipated to be? Remember, this first term is an innovation. So the question is, how big is this innovation in response to a movement in consumption? Well, you can imagine if you add constant or you add things that do not affect utility, but they, they're, added, they're additively increasing the utility function, it's going to lower that effect. So you can actually sort of show what matters is that what matters is the ratio of theta to steady state level of utility. So for example, look at this. So here's my same uh, different levels of theta before, so risk aversion. If I keep the steady state at 1, this first row is essentially what I had before. You can get a pretty big uh, term premium with, you know, high risk aversion, we get a pretty big term premium. But suppose I add other things to the utility function that make, at, make uh, utility positive or more positive than it otherwise would be. This term just completely disappears. So that there's something. There's something a little odd about these guys, that the level of lifetime utility matters, and the level of lifetime utility is not immune to additive things like leisure or like government purchases or like anything, anything that would provide utility that's sort of separate from consumption. And what that does is because the risk here is movements in lifetime utility, anything that augments lifetime utility dulls the effect of consumption on lifetime utility. And so it makes these people less risk averse. Or last remark about these easy guys. What I mentioned to begin with, how do you explain the term premium and does it matter for monetary policy? The easy approach can do it. But I think it's sort of clear by what I've said already that if you follow the easy approach, the term premium is actually entirely irrelevant for monetary policy. The, this approach to the term premium has you back out the term premium at the end. So you get a full-blown DSG model determining consumption, inflation, output, wages, all that sort of stuff. You get a full-blown DSG model. And the term premium just gets spit out at the end. So if you think of it that way, there's absolutely no reason the central bank should care about the term premium at all. I guess the, the only possible mechanism would be if it would affect the central bank's ability to forecast or something. but. It was surely would not be part of the central bank's um, uh, objective function. Um, it appears to be entirely irrelevant. And so here's a sort of a thought exercise I got at the bottom. Suppose I took a standard, uh, like a smith of Hooters paper, and estimated that medium-scale DSG model and added as an observable the 10-year rate. So if I added, so I used all their observables, but added the 10-year rate as an extra observable. The model, of course, will not be to match the 10-year rate exactly, because we, we believe, or at least the data suggests, there's a term premium in the data. So it's not going to match it. But instead, what it will do is it just treat it as measurement error. So the term premium is going to be measurement error from that, persp that modeling perspective. And of course, you never respond to measurement error. <laughs> it's called measurement error. So that this easy approach to the term premium can give you a term premium, maybe in hokey ways, maybe not. That's for you to ultimately decide. But it definitely says that it is irrelevant for policy, absolutely irrelevant. So here's a real quick down memory lane. So there's this old saying that inside, I don't know if you've ever heard this saying, inside every old guy, inside every old guy is a young guy. 
wondering what the hell happened. So here's an old guy talking. Uh, we had a similar type of question about autocorrelations and a monetary issue some time ago. And that is, how do you get a liquidity effect? What's meant by a liquidity effect? How does a movement up in money growth drive down nominal interest rates? So how do you get that negative sort of relationship? Well, 25 years ago, it was well known that that's impossible. You can't get it to happen. And you can sort of see why if I just look at the uh, standard Fisher equation here. Um, so I get a standard Fisher equation here where I is the nominal rate of interest. So suppose I assume, again, this is independent, this result is pretty much independent of preferences and money demand. So suppose I use log utility and use a cash advance constraint for money demand. Um, what do I get? Uh, that same relationship becomes very simple. It looks like that. So notice the uh, nominal interest rate depends only upon future money growth, right? So that sounds good because that means current money growth is a, I can, I can move for free. So how do you get a liquidity effect? I need current money growth to go up and the interest rate to go down. So I need GT to go up um, and the interest rate to go down. So how do I get the interest rate to go down? I need tomorrow's money growth to go down. So if money growth is negatively autocorrelated, you can get a liquidity effect. If money growth is negatively autocorrelated, you can get a liquidity effect. Doesn't it sound like something before? If the margin rates, if stochastic discount factors are negatively autocorrelated, you can get a liquidity effect. You need the same thing here. To get a term premium, you need negative autocorrelation. Here you need negative autocorrelation. But of course, this is a non-starter because money growth is highly serially correlated. So what did we do 25 years ago? Oh, by the way, here's just a quick aside. If you want to follow this route, you can get a term premium really simply by just, you can use risk neutral preferences and assume that inflation is an ARMA. <laughs> we have inflation being an ARMA like that, you can get a liquidity or you can get a term premium like very simply. You don't need to do anything else. But of course, we don't believe that because this is counterfactual inflation behavior. So right, what did we do 25 years ago? Um, some of us use models of segmented markets. Um, so these are these limited participation models that uh, Bob Lucas developed and that I had the chance to work on uh, back when I, in my job market paper, actually. Um, the other solution is the one that I think is the best. <laughs> I don't know it's the best solution, but it's sort of the solution you always follow if you have someone you don't like to talk with. Um, you just ignore them. Um, so the advantage of using the interest rate rule is no one talks about money growth anymore. But of course, if one looks at almost every estimated DNK model, if I look to see the implied behavior of money growth, you never get liquidity effects in any of those models. We've just effectively ignored it. So what I'm going to do for the rest of this talk is now, instead of looking at a model with the easy preferences, I'm going to look at a model with segmented markets. So uh, the, the paper that I think Alberto had made available to distribute to is this one. It's work in progress. Or actually, right now, we're working on estimating a thing. But I'll show you what the model's like that we have right now. Any model of segmentation sort of has similarity to the previous models of uh, segmentation. Um, so here are the two, I think, most well-known of these. Um, uh, for those who are familiar with the papers, you'll probably notice differences and similarities. But I just want to call those to your attention. So all these models have to have uh, uh, have to do two things. One is they have to segment markets. You've got to separate markets. Now, in the thing we're thinking about, we're thinking about a term premium. I somehow need to separate the long bond market from the short bond market. So those previous papers that I mentioned, these two right here, um, they just they just do it in a certain way. You got to somehow segment the market so that short bonds are somehow traded differently than long bonds. So that's one thing you got to do. Um, and then on top of that, that's never enough because you not only have to segment markets, but then you have to limit arbitrage. You got to make sure that no one can take advantage of the segmentation to eliminate the price difference. So you need segmentation, and then you need something that limits the ability to arbitrage across that segmentation. So what are our assumptions? I'll look at the equations in a moment, but I think just in words, it's sort of straightforward. We're going to assume that households have direct access to only short markets. So how do they, they can access long-term markets only indirectly. So I, we use the letter FI, financial institutions. 
The other thing, this is pretty general for the entire financial system. So households, if they want to access the long market, they do it indirectly. These indirect agents, they're the ones who hold long-term stuff. So the financial intermediaries at a financial institution hold long bonds, both government and investment bonds. I'll talk about that in a moment. So that segment, these guys are separated, or this market is separated from this market because households can only interact in the one, and they interact indirectly in the other. So that's the uh, segmentation. Now, how do you get arbitra or how do you limit arbitrage? Well, we got to somehow limit it. <laughs> so we're, we're going to make it so that the amount of deposits that the financial intermediaries can accept is affected by their net worth. But it's going to be a hold-up constraint. And these models all have features like this. It's going to be a hold-up constraint that limits uh, arbitrage uh, by net worth. And then we're going to limit net worth behavior in sort of standard ways. We're going to have there be adjustment costs in net worth, and there's going to be extra impatience. So I'll spell out those details. But that's the idea. Households are saved short. Financial intermediaries save long. Um, and financial intermediaries have some adjustment costs. Now, that will give me a term premium. Uh, but that will not mean the term premium matters. If you think about just the model from before with uh, easy preferences, we had a term premium, but the term premium is irrelevant. So we want a term premium, but we also want the term premium to matter. Um, so again, I'm an old dog. I don't learn any new tricks. So now I don't have a cash in advance constraint. I have a loan in advance constraint. So what that means is if a, a firm wants to purchase a new investment good, it pays for it by floating a new bond. And these bonds are all going to be long-term. We're going to calibrate it to be 10 years, or you can calibrate it to be anything you want. Uh, so we're going to, the, the firm must float a 10-year bond to finance investment purchases. Um, and these 10-year bonds floated by the firm are called investment bonds. And then there will be government bonds floated by the Treasury. And those long-term bonds are the ones that the financial intermediaries uh, purchase. So what about these bonds? You may have seen these guys before. Uh, my, the one I first learned this from is a paper by Mike Woodford from some time ago, but I think other people may have uh, used these before. So instead of having, it's it's convenient to have them have like a long-term feature just so that things are recursive. So these are sort of like um, uh, guests. They sort of never leave. <laughs> these are guests that just sort of decay. What I mean by it, is, uh, is, is think one loose way to think about it, suppose the payoff of the bond is a dollar, and then it pays kappa, and then it pays kappa squared, kappa cubed, where kappa is a fraction. So the bond never disappears, but it's becoming increasingly less important. Um, so kappa is a rate of decay, and you can sort of choose kappa to mimic what looks like a 40-quarter or 10-period bond. So F then, if I think about this, F is the, what is CI? CI is the new issuance of bonds by, of uh, I use CNI because it's supposed to be like um, uh, commercial and investment bonds. So that these are uh, the bonds uh, issued by uh, firms for investment purposes. So this is the infinite sum of past bonds issued where you notice they're weighted by kappa because they're dying away. Not because of default, but because the, the uh, repayment rate is shrinking. So this is the, the past uh, sum of uh, previous issuances. And what's nice about that is I can use that then to say that the new issuance, the number of new consoles issued, is just this difference. So that whenever you, this term here is going to appear a lot in the, in the sequel, and it's just the amount of new bonds issued, amount of new bonds issued. So right, here's the uh, loan and advance constraint. So Ryan, do you have a cash advance constraint? So this is what I'm going to buy. This is the price of investment goods. And then the right-hand side is how many bonds, again, you see this top part is how many new bonds I issue times the real price of those bonds. So Q is the nominal price of the bond, uh, P is the price of it. So it's the real price of the bond times the number of new bonds issued. And I need enough of those to finance um, investment. If I set uh, these down to be one period bond, these effects largely disappear. So the fact that it's a 10-year bond is a big deal. So what do I got? I got house, I use the phrase, oh, if you notice this odd thing, households and firm. In the United States, actually, a big thing in editorial these days, people are always asking, are corporations, oh, wait, I'm sorry, Alberto's got a question. Um, yes, invest, financing is only for new investment. That's correct. Alberto asks, is financing only for investment in the entire capital stock? It's just for new investment. 
So one way, I guess, probably the answer is yes and no, because every all the new bonds are for new investment, but that means the stock of bonds is some sense related to the total stock of capital. So I would answer yes and no. <laughs> I hope that seems fair. So they're only issuing new bonds for the new investment, but if I sum up the existing stock of bonds, that's going to be related to the capital stock. Okay, but back to households and firms. Um, uh, the way I've got it set up here is the households are the ones accumulating capital. That is not really necessary. Um, uh, you could just as easily have the firms be separate from households and pay out dividends to households. It's entirely the same. I have it set up here, the households are accumulating capital, but you, you may find it more intuitive to think of the firm as accumulating capital. But whoever is accumulating capital, back to Alberto's question, must finance enough new bonds to purchase the new investment. So this is the constraint that gives us real effects. That constraint gives us real effects. Again, the segmentation will give us a term premium. This will make the term premium matter. So anyway, this sort of sees the distortion right here. So this equation looks like the standard capital accumulation equation. So RK is like the, the marginal product of capital. Um, PK is the price of capital. Lambda T is the marginal utility consumption. I guess it says all of that there. If we did not have the omegas, if we do not have those omega terms, that's exactly the real business cycle or even DNK capital accumulation equation. It's exactly the one we used to. So what's novel here is this omega guy. And this omega is a distortion. And the paper sort of shows the details. But this is essentially the ratio of the Lagrange multiplier, the Kuhn-Tucker condition associated with this. So there's a Kuhn-Tucker association condition with this. Um, and that maps right into this omega. Oh, so here, if I, okay, yeah. I'm sorry, I was looking to see if Alberto had another question. Um, so anyway, this omega is the loan and advance constraint distortion. It all, it, in some sense, it makes it more expensive to purchase capital. In fact, it's intuitive to think that it's PK times omega. PK times omega. It sort of grosses up the price of capital because you have to finance it with a long bond. Anyway, then, log linearizations are beautiful because they hide things. They hide a lot, but hopefully they reveal something. Because look at this top equation. Um, the paper goes through the details again, but you can show this up to a linear transformation. That the this term on the left is the term premium. I'll get to your question just a moment, uh, Alberto. The term on the left is the term premium. The term on the right, this omega, is just the log of the previous big omega. So the segmentation distortion, which is this guy, is essentially the term premium. Okay, I'm sorry, what's Alberto's question? Uh, omega, oh yes, I'm sorry, that's right, thank you. Alberto asked about the omega and in the paper, that's right. The I'm using the term omega here, unfortunately, in the paper I think we use the letter M, a capital M in the paper, uh, uh, Greek letter omega here, I apologize, thanks. Uh, so the uh, paper's got an M, here I got an omega. That's a technology shock. <laughs> OK. So anyway, uh, that, that omega comes from a, the Kuhn-Tucker condition on that constraint. Um, so again, notice, by the way, if there were not that constraint, this sort of thing sort of disappears, right? That, that's sort of interesting here. Um, but anyway, that we have, uh, this I think is very intuitive. Well, I find it so. My co-authors don't, but I find it's intuitive. Because what is that guy? I still, I'm an old-fashioned economist. I still think about things at some level. I try to get intuition from supply and demand curves. And that thing looks like a demand curve for investment. Because on the left-hand side, I have the price of capital. And when I'm thinking about buying, I compare the price of capital to the present value of the marginal flows of that capital. So here's like the profit flow comes from an a increased unit of capital. So I compare the price of capital with the subsequent flow. So these, these two terms are entirely standard. What's unusual is this, that the term premium lowers the demand for investment directly because, again, you need to float a 10-year loan to finance a uh, investment project. So we have a, the demand curve is distorted by this, by, uh, directly distorted by the term premium. By the way, that suggests something we're going to, I think it's sort of quite clear. Now the term premium is going to matter because it's a distortion. 
So whenever you hear the word distortion, it's like you want to stabilize it. So there's going to be a clear policy implication here. Term premium movements are welfare reducing here, and you want to do what you can to eliminate them. And it comes from really that equation. So let's look at the uh, financial intermediaries. These, are, I think, are pretty standard. Um, I'm going to use the letter X here just to denote total assets. Uh, they hold two things. Um, so the B are the government bonds. The F are the investment bonds issued by the firms. And they finance them by accepting deposits and using their net worth. Um, in a moment, I'll use, uh, I'll use the letter L for leverage. Uh, so what does leverage mean? I'm going to take my net worth and use it, augment it with deposits, and lever that up to a much higher level of uh, asset acquisition. Um, so leverage that letter will be coming up in just a moment. So right, what's the hold-up constraint? The hold-up constraint is this. The story goes something like this. Imagine, and you can tell stories lots of different ways, but here's the easiest way to tell the story. Suppose at the end of a period, the, the so at the beginning of a period, the financial meter accepts deposits, provide purchases bonds, both investment bonds and government bonds. So uh, the financial meter accepts deposits, buys these assets, um, and sort of that's the end of the period for the, that's the end of activity. However, at the very end of the period, the financial meter has the option of just taking off with its assets and defaulting on its deposits. So they can run away. Now, what we want to do is make it so that it's always incentive compatible for them to never run away. And this is what this hold-up constraint does. So let me show you what these two sides are. So the left-hand side are, again, this is the end of the period. So at the end of the period, if I run away, I lose the lifetime utility of being a financial in intermediary. Because once you leave, you're done. So once you default, you no longer can be a financial institution. So this is the lifetime utility of not defaulting. Now, what's in the right-hand side? The right-hand side is if I default, what do I get? Well, if I default, what is L times N? L times N, leverage times net worth is X. Well, look at that. I can make an X. <laughs> this is very exciting. Look at that, X. So these are assets. So these assets are going to pay off something tomorrow. RL is just my notation for the one period expected return on the assets. So these assets are going to pay off RL, and then this just discounts them back to today. So they're going to pay off RL. I discount them back to uh, time T. So if I run away, I get these assets, but I don't get all of them. I only get a fraction. So mu is the fraction of assets I can hide from my depositors. So as long as it's more valuable to stay in business than to run away, and this is the run away part, so this is default. Let's see if I can do this. I feel like I'm doing spirograph. <laughs> this is default. Oh, I'm sorry. This is sort of fun. So this is default. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> this is default, and the left-hand side is uh, staying in business. So as long as it's more advantageous to stay into business than it is to default, they're never going to default. So you see what's going on here in some sense is that this limits, puts a limit between uh, net worth and deposits that can be supported by the net worth. Now, let's see here. Yes, uh, so that is correct. Yes, so Alberto asked about his leverage X over N or X is BP. Yes, that is correct. I hope everyone can see what Alberto types. That is correct. Now, in general, because we have, we're going to have adjustment costs in just a moment, this value function is, in general, not linear. So that's problematic, because I'd like net worth to cancel. I wonder if I can get rid of all of this. Let's see if I can get rid of all of this. No, well, maybe I can't. Just, just press draw again, and everything will be erased. OK. Oh, I see. Quick draw again. Ah, excellent. Thank you. OK. So oh, gosh, draw again. Oh, there it goes again. OK. So, um, well, what we'd like to do in this, in this hold-up constraint, if I think about on the left-hand side, I have the value function. On the right-hand side, I have, I have assets. Now, assets are leverage times net worth. It would be, what does it mean to say there's aggregation? What it means to say there's aggregation is that net worth, all i got to think about is average or aggregate net worth. For that to be true, it better be that net worth somehow cancels out of this leverage constraint. So what does that mean? It means that 
I surely uh, firms with more net or financial intermediaries with more net worth have more value. So V must be increasing in N. The right hand side is also increasing in N because more net worth means more assets. What I if there were no adjustment costs on net worth, V is actually linear, and V is actually linear, and net worth would cancel from that constraint. But as you see in a moment, we're going to have adjustment costs in V so that V ends up having some concavity associated with it. So we're going to choose mu so that it matches that concavity so that net worth cancels from this constraint. So leverage is going to, uh, leverage is going to be affected by, how should I say this? It, what's going to be true is that all financial intermediaries face the same leverage, and their net worth is just levered up by the same ratio. So there's going to be one level of leverage for every institution, every financial intermediary here. What that means is just it says at the bottom, we're going to make sure there's aggregation so that there is a representative. Okay, let me put this over here. Uh, there's going to be a uh, aggregation by ensuring that net worth cancels from this constraint. So that one way to think about it is higher levered uh, or institutions with higher net worth are, also, are more valuable, but they also face different levels of ability to abscond with their resources. So that, that's uh, we're making sure that we have aggregation. For those who are familiar with um, uh, with this sort of literature, this is, these assumptions are often embedded somewhere in there. The classic example is uh, the paper in the American Economic Review from a long time ago by Chuck Cross and myself. We assume that monitoring cost was linear. We assume that monitoring cost was linear in, uh, in project size. This sort of is corresponding to that. We're going to make sure that the uh, ability to take off with something or the amount of assets you can shield is the, the curvature in that, it matches the curvature in the value function. How do you do that the expression the independent event? Um, let's see here. Alberta asked another question about this. How can I, I don't want to belabor this too much. Um, let me just say this again. If there were no adjustment costs in V, if there were no adjustment costs in net worth, V would be linear in net worth, so N would cancel. Independent, you know, for just mu being a constant. So if there were no adjustment costs in portfolios, V would be linear in net worth, and literally net worth would cancel from this side, and net worth would cancel from that side. We have adjustment costs. So what does that mean? If we have adjustment costs, V is no longer linear. But we can always choose mu to match the nonlinearity in V so that we still can cancel net worth from uh, the, the leverage constraint. So the leverage is going to depend upon um, spreads, but will be independent of net worth. That's what's going to happen here. I hope that answers the question, but that's the idea. Again, a good metaphor is you can always put linearity in by clever choice of monitoring technology. Um, that's sort of the idea. Anyway, here we go. So what do I got? Here's the accumulation decision for the financial institution. Um, so V, again, is the value function. They're choosing net worth, dividends, leverage. Um, you notice they have extra discounting. So a couple of things I should probably uh, point out to you. Those who are familiar with this literature know there's always tricks like this. You make them impatient so that they don't accumulate too much net worth. Um, and then we're going to have adjustment costs on varying their balance sheet so that they can't easily scale up and scale down their balance sheet. There's some adjustment costs in that. So this guy here will limit um, uh, will limit net worth accumulation in the steady state. This will limit net worth accumulation dynamically. So these two together are going to give us there's limitations on how much they can arbitrage. Again, this constraint right here um, is the, the hold up constraint, and we're choosing the, the, the this sort of like a monitoring function so that uh, net worth drops out of this constraint so that we have aggregation. So what do I got? Well, the accumulation decision looks like this. Notice this constraint um, doesn't have a Kuhn-Tucker multiplier associated with leverage because leverage is, con is common for all net worth levels. So this is where that assumption pays off. I don't need to worry about that Kuhn-Tucker multiplier. It's not even relevant here. Um, so lambda, they pay out their profits ultimately to households. So that's why I'm discounting by lambda. Oops. They have extra discounting here. And then there's a spread. 
So that's my uh, accumulation decision, N is 2. So Alberto's uh, posing a question, so I'll pause just for a moment. Go ahead, Alberto. Yeah, because uh, as I understand, this is this is going to be the uh, optimality condition for the financial intermediary. And Correct. Yep. And here, here, what you are doing is uh, taking the first order condition uh, with respect to n to network. Yep. Where you have uh, instant constraint. So the the left hand side, as I understand it, is related to the to the dividend. Uh, yes, correct. Right. And and the right hand side is related to the participation constraint. And the participation constraint again is a function of L, but L in, in terms is a function of N. Leverage is a function of the network. Yeah. So, so there is no term there uh, taking that partial derivative. Yes. What? Um, so, well, I, may, I, I guess I would say things a little different than you had just said. Let's see if I can draw here. Ooh, I got too much drawn here. <laughs> so, so the left hand term, as you said, is the if you decide um, uh, to accumulate more net worth, that means you pay out less dividends. So that's the fact that I lose dividends. On the right hand side, if I accumulate net worth, that net worth means I can finance more projects. So L is the economy wide L. So L is independent. I've chosen my um, some sense I've chosen my monitoring technology so that L is independent of net worth. So L doesn't depend upon net worth. So L is just a, com a constant for all uh, financial intermediaries. So they accumulate net worth that allows them to finance asset L times N, and then there's a spread here. So the right hand side is the benefit to accumulating net worth, and the left hand side is the cost. So the idea is um, our, the assumptions on the monitoring are that this guy leverage does not depend upon net worth, that it's independent of it. Um, and that's backed over to here that we're choosing these monitoring so that net worth falls out of this constraint. That's the idea. Uh, I hope that, that answers. Uh, yeah, and perhaps I, I have to pay a little bit more attention on how you drive the, the monitoring cost to see how that cancels out. But th yeah, that's, uh, you can imagine. Yeah, I, one way to think about this actually intuitively is if we did not have adjustment costs, this would be a non-issue. Um, because without adjustment costs, it's straightforward to show that the value function is linear. And that means it directly cancels. So if it's not linear because you have adjustment costs, you can always make mu, this mu function, appropriately nonlinear to sort of, in some sense, undo it. Um, I don't want to belabor that now, but uh, that, that's sort of the idea. Okay. Um, so in any event, I should, oh, you're welcome. I should call your attention, though, now, before I go on. This guy, oops, let me draw. That term is critical. So what that is, that psi n is going to tell me how quickly these guys can adjust their behavior to take advantage of arbitrage. So when, uh, there's, when there's an increase in a term premium, these financial institutions want to accept more deposits than to buy more long-term bonds. And what limits their ability to do that is how quickly they can acquire net worth. So psi n is the term that's going to drive how quickly these guys can respond to movements in the term premium. So psi n is a key parameter to estimate. Just as before, you can uh, write down sort of an intuitive expression for what this thing looks like. This is sort of like a supply curve. That's probably not quite fair, but it's sort of like it. Before, I had like a demand curve for loans. Let's see what, what I mean by demand curve for loans. Uh, right here. Uh, uh, this is quite a mess. But this expression in Mendel, I had investment demand. It's like a demand curve for loans, which had the term premium in it. Now I have a supply curve for uh, loans. That, oops, I went too far. Uh, here I, in some sense, have a supply curve for loans, which says that the term premium affects this institution's desire to accumulate net worth. So I have a higher term premium makes these guys want to accumulate net worth to take advantage of it. 
Um, higher term premium lowers the demand for investment. So I have these two things working, uh, you know, in contrary purposes, then that's what sort of gives you equilibrium behavior. Uh, but again, it's this, um, this side guy is critical. So in this model, it's nice, I guess, about the feature model. All I can do is set psi equal to zero, and I get exactly the DNK model, um, the standard DSG DNK model. So this, this parameter is fundamental. I think this is uh, sort of gives you a sense of how the model is going to work, and I'll show you pictures in a moment. So here's my balance sheet for the central bank. That's this top constraint here, just a balance sheet. So suppose the central bank central bank purchases alter this. Well, you might say maybe that has no real effect because deposits and net worth would just move in a way to sort of cancel with this. I guess that's not very helpful. <laughs> so the central bank can alter the level of uh, the debt in the economy, government debt in the economy, but that cannot easily uh, be matched by movements in uh, net worth and leverage of the financial institutions because of these adjustment costs. So that means necessarily movements in government debt need to be counteracted partially by movements in investment debt. And investment debt is going to move if and only if there's movement in the term premium. So we see there's like a this term on the left-hand side of the, the balance sheet here, you sort of, not quite, but these guys are just sort of offsetting one another. That's how QE is going to work. So let me show you some pictures of how this model works. I'm going to look at two types of policies. Uh, one policy is going to be one where the debt is exogenous. Maybe this is more like the QE experiment. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have, suppose the central bank follows a Taylor rule over the short rate, and then there's some exogenous movement in the long debt level. So that's what I'm calling B. B is the real level of long debt. That would be one set of policies to look at. The other policy I'm going to call endogenous debt, this is reminiscent of that quote by Governor Bernanke at the beginning, that an alternative is the central bank could just peg the term premium and then let the central bank's balance sheet be entirely passive. That's the other possibility. So I'll look at both of these. But we'll start with these first ones um, because evidently these, these guys, these first ones, uh, let's see here. Evidently, these guys here are sort of like the QE stuff, right? This is what's meant by a QE policy, some exogenous movement in debt. Uh, we have, you wonder why we have an AR2. We have an AR2, so we sort of like it. There would be a buildup of, of uh, purchases. That's the only reason. So here's uh, a calibration. As I said, the project I'm trying to finish up right now is estimating a model like this. But we're, a lot of these numbers are pretty standard, at least in this literature. So we're having a term premium spread 100 basis points. I mentioned that earlier. Not at all clear what to do with leverage because we're sort of thinking this sort of as a fairly amorphous uh, financial institution, so the financial system. But we're using this number six. I don't know if it's good or bad. I think that's what Mark Gertler and uh, uh, Pete Karate used, if I remember. Um, the ratio of government debt to total assets matters. So we're just using a number here that's not crazy. Um, I'm going to use 40 quarters uh, for the duration. So these are 10-year bonds for both investment and government. Um, this is the critical parameter. And as you can imagine, this is a parameter we're interested in, in estimating an ongoing work right now. For now, we're cheating. It's always sort of exciting to cheat. We're going to choose the level of cyan to match numbers for what people think the central bank's ability was to affect um, uh, long rates in response to their purchases. So we're choosing this guy to hit a certain movement in the term premium. So here's the picture, or maybe this didn't come across as big as I had hoped. But anyway, so look down here, maybe the bottom right first, because um, this sort of shows what's happening. Um, the way this is written is it's the amount of government bonds on the hands of the um, uh, in the hands of the, uh, the banking system. So these are purchases that drive down the amount of debt being held by the financial system. So these are this is quantitative easing. The central bank is purchasing debt. So that means there's less debt on the hands, uh, less government debt on the hands of banks. So what does that necessarily mean? They're going to match that by trying to do loaning, lending of other kinds. So that's going to drive down the long rates. 
and does so by driving down the term premium. So if you look, the long rate, the 10-year rate is here. We get a movement of about 20 or 25 basis points. So I'll talk about blue and black in a moment. Uh, we get a decline in the term premium. Um, the decline in term premium stimulates investment, of course, the output. This is sort of reminds you of an investment-specific shock, so consumption tends to move oppositely. It's a demand shock, so it drives up inflation. Um, one sort of interesting thing is the 10-year rate stays down persistently. These are 20 quarters. The term premium largely dissipates by that time. But at that point, we just have normal expectations hypothesis stuff going on. The short rate is going to be low for a long time subsequent to this, so that makes the long rate stay low. So you get initial movements driven by the term premium, later movements driven by expectation stuff. Now, what is the blue and the black line? Maybe I hope maybe it's a little clearer where you are. Um, the blue line is the baseline uh, model with the Taylor rule. The black line is sort of suggested by the zero bound. So we're just holding the black line holds the funds rate constant so that it can't respond for four quarters. It's a way to mimic a zero bound that although the central bank might want to vary rates for some reason are holding rates at zero. So black versus blue is just the stimulus that comes from a zero bound. In any event, here, um, as I think is as suggested, um, the term premium matters because this movement in term premium affects real activity. Here's some sensitivity analysis for different levels of psi n. I think the paper had these numbers wrong in the version I circulated here. If so, I apologize. Um, and the psi n's that are meant are, should have been scaled up by a factor of six in the paper that I circulated. Oh, I don't know how I get rid of my... <laughs> oh, there we go. Um, so in any event, uh, I guess probably what I should just mention is how for a variety of psi n, you can get fairly significant movements in the 10-year yield and significant movements in inflation. Um, but of course, if you get psi n equals zero, they disappear entirely. Um, so the psi n is the key uh, arbitrage parameter and decides if it's important. And then we look at different degrees of stickiness. Pardon me, different degrees of stickiness. If the bonds become less duration, the effects are smaller. If the bonds become longer duration, the effects are bigger. This is sort of just what you would expect. Yes, this is the same as. Oh, is it the same numbers? Oh, that's good. All right, very good. I'm glad I circulated the right thing. Yeah, so these are uh, just some sensitivity analysis on the QE sort of thing. However, we use QE to sort of calibrate the model, um, but we're actually interested in other questions. So what do I got here? These next slides are really sort of more than what the paper is titled. Remember, it's titled Targeting Long Rates. So what do I got here? Again, maybe I should have made this bigger for you all. Um, so I've got... Uh, a couple of policies. Listen, this is a shock to the margin efficiency of investment, so a shock to the ability to produce investment goods. Um, and it's looking at two types of policies. One is where you just follow, you're holding, there's no quantitative easing policies happening. You just hold the uh, central bank's long debt level fixed. The other is you peg the term premium. So you passively buy or sell long-term debt to prevent the term premium from moving. So that's two of the things that are drawn. So, uh, uh, the blue is the term premium peg. That's where you hold the term premium fix. You can sort of see it down here, I guess, most easily. Um, oops, wrong guy here. Uh, that's the right pencil. If I look down here, this this panel down here. So blue is if I hold the term premium fix. Uh, green, um, uh, green is if I uh, hold the debt level fix. So of course, then the term premium moves. And last, black is actually the optimal policy which in this, up to this framework so far is actually sort of straightforward. The optimal policy is to stabilize inflation and stabilize the segmentation distortion. Um, so that essentially is the same as stabilizing the term premium. So you can sort of see what the optimal policy does, what the um, uh, a term premium peg does. I guess what for the MEI shocks, one thing you can notice is especially things like output and maybe consumption. A lot of these behaviors are similar. And in fact, if you notice, the term premium movement is pretty trivial. So for MEI-type shocks, um, it looks like whether you target the uh, term premium or not, it appears it doesn't seem to matter that much because these movements are so modest. Okay, so for MEI shocks, it appears that the term premium peg seems not so important. Here's a total factor productivity shock where actually the effects are bigger. 
Here at TFP shock, because it has such a big effect on inflation, in fact, it's interesting how the effect of TFP shock on inflation is important here and in the Epstein Zinn story. Here, because I'll get to Alberta's question in just a moment. Here, because of the shock to inflation, um, there ends up being a shock to the term premium. Now, why is that? Well, the shock to inflation affects, remember, these are nominal bonds, and they're long term. So a shock to inflation makes the real value of existing investment debt go way up. Right? So a shock that pushes down the price level makes the real value of in existing investment bonds go way up. That drives the term premium way up. So if I look at um, the baseline case, um, what happens to like output? Output way under response. Investment actually moves perversely. Consumption rises. But you see you get an under response because investment is behaving so badly because of the term premium policy. The thing you should notice is that the term premium peg and the optimal policy are not on top of each other but are really close. And it's because if I look at just what the term premium does, it's desirous to prevent these sharp increases in the term premium so that the optimal policy and a term premium peg look a lot alike. Yes, in terms of, so what I mean by optimal policy, Albert was asking about how these simulations are done. Here the Taylor rule is just standard, but we augment it with another equation that says term premium equal term premium steady state. So let me go back to, to close the model, to close this model I need either the equation one or equation two, or an equation like equation two. So equation one, I'm making the debt level exogenous. Equation two, I'm making the term premium exogenous. I need one of these two equations. So I'm just using these two types of policies below. So exogenous debt is what I call the baseline. Endogenous debt is called the term premium peg. So I'll come to Taylor rules in a moment. But these are just the central bank follows a standard Taylor rule over inflation and output. Um, and they also target the term premium or they target the long rate. Let me slide up here again. Oh, one uh, quick comment. I should slide through these last couple quickly so I can get in under get a good time. So this one is sort of interesting. This is a shock to the, that mu parameter, which is that mu is like the holdup parameter. So if the holdup problem becomes worse, so if credit conditions worse, how does that manifest itself? It manifests itself in a large increase in the term premium. That's what's down here. Um, so again, it's nice to start these pictures by looking at this, this guy down here. So a credit shock drives up the term premium because it's more costly or it's more difficult to, um, to do intermediation. So the term premium rises sharply, which leads real activity to tank. Um, that's under a policy of exogenous debt. If you notice, the the, uh, the term premium peg does just oppositely. What the term premium peg does is when credit conditions tighten, the central bank naturally buys more government debt. This is this is endogenous quantitative easing, <laughs> right? If I'm trying to peg the term premium, then I have to move my holdings of government bonds in response to uh, shocks. So the thing to notice here is they do it in such a way to peg the term premium so that then everything is sterilized. This probably reminds some of you to this long ago result by Bill Poole that if you target interest rates, you eliminate money demand shocks. Here, if you target the term premium, you eliminate shocks that originate in that market. So a shock like this is entirely sterilized um, by a term premium pick. Quick summary of these welfare gains. So what do I got? I take, uh, oh, I guess I don't report them here. The paper reports them. So I assume standard deviations for TFP and MEI shocks, because I think those are sort of the interesting ones to compare. And I choose the levels to match a certain variability of output. And then I choose their relative variabilities. Um, uh, if I put, if I have both shocks in one, I choose the relative variabilities to match some evidence on the importance of MEI shocks. So anyway, this is the welfare gain of using a term peg compared to the other. As I alluded to before, for the MEI shocks, these numbers are pretty modest. This number is not zero, but pretty, pretty modest. And it's sort of, as I mentioned before, the MEI shocks just don't make the term premium move by very much, so it seems not so important. But the TFP shocks, it's a big deal. Um, you get large movements in the term premium, and they're perverse. So let me back up to that slide. Oh, here it is. Um, for the TFP shock, you get perverse movements in a term premium. 
Um, and that actually is welfare reducing. And so there's an advantage to the central bank preventing this from happening. So that's where you see these, uh, these welfare numbers are bigger when I look at TFP shocks. Not surprisingly, the, um, uh, when you put both shocks together, um, you end up, <laughs> not surprising, you end up somewhere in between when you put both together. Um, so that's where these two. Uh, the better way to do this is what, as I said, we're trying to finish up now, is try to estimate the level of these shocks using Bayesian methods and then use those estimates to come out with these welfare gains. But I, again, the thing that sort of drives it is the behavior of inflation alters the real value of the existing nominal investment debt, and that affects the term premium, and that's welfare reducing. So any shocks that lead to sharp movements in inflation should somehow be uh, responded to. That, that's sort of the idea here. I've got only a few minutes, so I'll go through this sort of quickly. Now, here's the sort of policy rules that Alberto had alluded to in his question. Um, another way of thinking about this is putting the term premium in a Taylor rule. There's another way to do the policy. So you don't, you keep debt fixed, so we're not going to do quantitative easing, so we're just keeping the, 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 we keep the central bank's long bond portfolio fixed, but instead we vary the short rate just in response to term premium. All right, so here this is, this is another way of thinking about the term premium and a, put it into the policy rule. Um, and so we're going to look at different levels of tau, tau p, so the, the coefficient on the term premium. Um, there's questions of determinacy that I, I'll set aside for now and, and just look at what you should do. So again, the key parameter will be tau, tau p. And what we've graphed here, oh, I should back up again. Um, so for these pictures, I'm putting rho to like 0.8. I got tau pi at 1.5. I got tau y at a half. So those sort of standard um, uh, Taylor rule numbers. And then I'm going to vary tau tau p and look at the welfare consequence. So for the MEI shocks, I guess, again, probably what you should notice is these numbers are fairly modest on the uh, vertical axis. Um, and it's a welfare gain relative to t of having no effect in the premium. Um, so here, there's actually a welfare gain to having a positive coefficient on the term premium. But again, these welfare gains are sort of modest. If I look at the uh, TFP shocks, TFP shocks, it goes just the other way. And this is what you might think. When the term premium goes up, when the term premium goes up, it's welfare. If the cycle is driven by TFP shocks, when the term premium goes up, you actually want to reduce, um, you want to reduce the short rate. And so what I've got here, notice first, these magnitudes are much bigger. And it's welfare, the welfare advantage is to have a negative coefficient. So it's welfare advantageous to have a negative response to the term premium when the cycle is driven by these shocks. Again, the key difference is how these two shocks affect inflation. So I'll leave that, I'll just leave that on the table for, for those who are interested, you can explore that. But that's the key issue. How do the shocks affect inflation? And again, if you add the two shocks together, you get that the positive the negative coefficient wins mainly because the TFP shock, the, the gain is so big. Okay, so before when you had long dead mind, you had that you were going to get a shock. Ah, that is a good question. Um, so the Alberto asked about the two. I was considering two types of policies. One type of policy was directly targeting the long rate this way, right? Some direct target on the long rate and passively varying government bonds, long-term government bonds to hit it. These other policies are holding long bonds fixed and just varying the short rate. It is clearly better to do the first. Um, it's clearly better to not, you know, forget about this. So oh, I got too much there. <laughs> so it's clearly better to not have it in the Taylor rule but directly target the term premium. That actually is the best type of response. And it sort of is intuitive if the, if the distortion comes in a term premium, then it's best advantageous to target it directly so that you would have a policy for both the term premium and for the short rate. Now, that sounds pretty dramatic, but let me show you, show you a quote here. Let me go up to this quote. This is a quote I, one of the quotes I began the, the uh, session with. Um, so here, this, the, this was Governor Bernanke. He wasn't chairman at the point, but he was talking about, you know, 
back in 2002, whoever would have thought that we would be at zero, right? <laughs> I mean, it's sort of funny. See, he's like, you know, this is like, oh, this is never going to happen, you know. But, but what if it's not at zero? What should we do? Notice again, it's 2002, right? So um, what would we do? Well, one possibility is to directly target long rates directly target long rates. And so that's the type of policy that um, those welfare things were for. So it, uh, there, there seems to be the best gain for going directly to that. If you have another distortion, it's advantageous to have another tool. So if I use the short rate to deal with one distortion, but now there's another distortion, the segmentation distortion, then it's advantageous to have a second tool, which in this case would be a term premium policy rule or long rate policy where you could target the long rate. And that's what this has in mind. So let me back up to conclude. So there seems to be some advantages of having a term premium in a Taylor rule. Um, which way the coefficient should go, positive or negative, depends upon the type of shocks. So this is this uh, these two I'm looking at before. Again, these welfare gains come from the fact that debt is nominal. If debt is real, these welfare gains become much smaller. Um, but Alberto asked if you had to do it with a Taylor rule on the short rate or a Taylor or a, t or a term premium rule directly, actually, this rule is more advantageous. And I use the rule Taylor rule, but actually, a term premium peg makes a lot of sense. So I don't know, it would be interesting, actually, to think about a model of this type and you know, let me back up to here. Well, okay, so here I've got, you don't need to have a term premium policy like this. You could have the term premium policy be something like a Taylor rule policy. So you could have it depend upon inflation and output, right? You could have a policy for both long rates and short rates that look sort of like Taylor rules. Those are, that's another possibility. Um, so there's some sense to that. Here's this quote that I've sort of, gone over already uh, by Ben Bernanke. And then um, let me sort of end with, uh, I guess, two com comments. One, I, I started out by saying the term premium is becoming increasingly important in monetary policy formulation. There's two ways to go at this. One is this preference approach, Epstein-Zinn type approach. Um, that has very stark policy implications, meaning that the term premium does not matter. Um, here, this alternative model is a model where the term premium matters because the term premium reflects the degree of market segmentation. So if market segmentation gets exacerbated, <clears throat> there's reasons that the central bank should intervene to sort of dampen that. So the term premium matters. However, I sometimes hear people say you should always think about the term premium because it gives you an extra policy instrument. I actually sort of think that's fuzzy logic. What I mean by that is you should target, let me get my pencil. What do I mean by this sort of odd comment with teenagers? <laughs> if, if the term premium matters for real uh, behavior, then of course the term premium matters, right? But that occurs because there's some sort of distortion that makes the term premium matter. So you have an extra instrument uh, you have an extra policy interest, but you also have an extra problem. So it's not like you have any more degrees of freedom. You have, a extra you have an extra tool, but you have an extra problem. You have an extra tool, but you have an extra problem. So it's not like there's a free lunch here at all. Um, it reminds me of, I use this phrase, teenagers. I have a son who recently learned to drive, and I sort of thought, oh, that's going to be great, because now I have an extra instrument. I have an extra driver. But of course, I'm sure if you all think about that, especially if you have a teenager who drives a automobile not very well, uh, you realize that the teenager also creates problems. <laughs> That's what I mean by saying it's sort of like teenagers. That the term premium, yeah, I agree with you, Albert. Why did you buy, why I bought him a car? That's the problem. Um, we sort of have a situation that if the term premium matters, you also need to use it to fix the problem that makes it matter. If the term premium matters, you need to you need to use the term premium to fix the problem that made it matter. That's what I mean by this. It's not an extra degree of freedom. It's a an extra solution to an extra problem. 
Last but not least, for those who are people, macro guys like me, you appreciate this. If you're finance guys, you won't. Um, you know, there's a lot of finance literature that does stuff like this. We have to, I mean, we need to work on this, guys. <laughs> this term premium stuff, um, these are important questions. Um, and what I mean by this is, we have to think of ways, what I mean by leaving it to the finance guys, we have to think of ways of putting this term premium into full-blown DSGE models. Um, that seems like the right way for it. I think that's an important question. I think that's an important question. So with that, I think I'm just two minutes over, um, but I uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk to you all. So uh, let's... Let's see if someone uh, would like to ask a, a question. You can write it down here in the chat window, or you can raise your hand with the status icon, and we'll be glad to open your microphone. Colbert, and if, if you want, I can open your microphone if, if that is easier. Your microphone is now enabled. Yeah, my, my question has to do with the correlations of the term premium and GDP, both in the data and the predicted by the model. Do you have any sense of uh, the predictions of the model? Yeah, that's a good question. I haven't, of course, that depends upon the shock. Um, so, uh, and of course, it depends upon the policy. But if I just look at the, sh the, the way these shocks are written right here, um, it looks like you're going to have the, the term premium. I, my guess is in my, when I get done with the estimated version of this, it's going to be driven by these shocks here. And this, you see a positive, auto -correla or positive correlation between the term premium and, and levels of output. Um, I think in the, uh, what is the stylized fact? I'd have to think about that. There's some dispute about the stylized fact, actually. Um, the reason there is dispute is there's dispute about the right way to measure the term premium. So there's a uh, Jonathan Wright and then Glenn Rudebush have had sort of a feud in the American Economic Review about Jonathan Wright reported what he thought were stylized facts, and then Glenn Rudebush and co-authors criticized his measure of the term premium. So the model predicts is going to, as I said, is going to be driven by what this picture says. But I think the stylized fact is not quite as obvious. Probably it may be a better way to think about it, where there's no dispute, is the correlation between the ten-year rate and GDP. I mean, a, we know what the ten-year rate is, right? And there, I think I actually think this correlation is positive. Um, uh, but the correlation between these two is not so obvious in the data just because the term premium is not as well measured. And there's dispute about how to measure it. So, Right. So one other uh, thing is that I, I, I saw in the first picture that it seems that there is a, a negative trend in the, in the term premium. And my first impression was that you actually wanted to talk about that. But um, is, is, is there anything there that you have thought about? Why no, no, I did. Yes. No, I think that's that's a unresolved question in literature too. I don't have a good answer for you. Um, you know, I agree. I mean, this is this is an astonishing trend. Yep, I agree. I agree. And I sort of terrible because there's a trend, and I was talking about this. <laughs> uh, our model has volatility, but our model, you know, of course you can cook it so that you get trend, but the model doesn't have a strong implication for a trend like this. Um, so that, that's a good observation. Right, I think if you look at the same series, there's a series by um, oh gosh, there's these guys at the New York Fed. I don't have their name at the top of my. Uh, I have. To, I, I it's uh, on Tobias Shin. Oh, I, I could get it wrong. I, I don't know. Anyway, they actually have data going back to the 60s, um, and then they have their term premium look something like this. It goes up, and then it goes down like this. So it's sort of curious. It's like. It seems highly correlated with the fact that there was this inflation burst in the middle. You know what I mean? Now, of course, this is in the 90s, but um, th there seems to be differences before, you know, like up to 1970s. The 70s to the 90s were sort of a mess. 
in terms of term premium behavior. And now this is sort of trending down. Boy, I've made a mess of that picture. <laughs> but yeah, the, the, the trend is another good question. Another good question. But I don't have a good answer for you. Thank you. Ah, that's it. Tobias Adrian. There we go. That's them. Yes. Uh, thank you. David Cohn just mentioned is a um, New York Fed uh, has data by this that uh, yeah because it's the ACM data. Uh, Tobias Adrian, Richard Crump, Benjamin Mills, and Emmanuel Mensch. Theirs goes back further. Uh, you know, it all comes down to how do you measure? How do you do the forecast of uh, future shorts? You know, because in some sense, the term premium is sort of simple. I look at the observed 10-year yield, and I compare it to the expected one-year short. But it's actually it's not quite so obvious what the best way is to forecast the one-year short. And so depending upon how one does that, you get different measures of the premium. So. I think David has this, actually, this paper that explains in part the trend. Ah, very good. Oh, very good. I will take a look. What is the story? David, can you summarize your story? Okay, very good. I'll have to look at that. I'll have to look at David's paper. David, if, if you have a, a microphone, I can open it for you. I'm reading what David's typing about habits, foreign purchase, and finance consumption, higher consumption, lower risk aversion. Huh. This is your job market paper, David? So can I ask David, are these, uh, what type of preferences? Are these preferences with um, uh, like blitz points or something? Is that what the, what are the preferences? I see. I have it, I see. You know, would you be kind enough to, um, you can probably get my email pretty easily. Could you send me your job market paper? I'd appreciate that. Excellent. Got it. Okay. Well, is there any other question? If not, I would like to thank uh, Tim first for this very interesting presentation. And I would like to remind you all that we have these webinars every Tuesday at the same time. Next week, we'll have Monica Piacesi from uh, Stanford University talking about bank risk exposure. And you can go to the website of the seminars where you can see the schedules and all the papers are, that are going to be presented. And we are going to schedule some more for September and October uh, to, to finish this first series of webinars. Thank you very much, Ken, um, Tim. And oh, you're welcome. Thank you.